All right. Welcome to our Traveling the Globe with IBD Facebook live chat in honor of World IBD Day 2022. My name is Katie Camper, and I'm the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation's Marketing Coordinator. Every year on May 19th, the global Crohn's and Colitis community honors World IBD Day. Organizations from 50 countries on five continents participate in awareness raising activities to shine a light on the debilitating nature of these chronic and incurable digestive diseases. Through World IBD Day this year, we mobilize the IBD community in the United States, along with our international partners, to say game over to IBD. Part of saying game over to IBD means finding a way to participate in fulfilling activities like travel, despite living with Crohn's and colitis. I'm joined here today by Kay Grievison, a nurse, Crohn's disease patient, and chairman and founder of IBD Passport, a resource for Crohn's and colitis patients who seek to travel. Kay joins us today to share tips for traveling the globe with IBD. Welcome, Kay. Thank you for joining. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm going to ask a few questions. You're going to tell us some interesting things. Um, but before we get into that, there are some housekeeping matters I want to just, you know, get out of the way. Today's chat is meant for educational purposes only, and the views shared during this chat are not meant to represent the official position of the foundation. Always consult with your provider before making changes with your IBD treatment regimen. And if you have any questions about travel and IBD that we do not get to today, you can contact our IBD Help Center by emailing info at Foundation.org or by calling 1-888-MY-GUT-PAIN to get your question answered. I would also like to thank our sponsors, Abvi, Amgen, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Fires, and Takeda, who made today's chat possible by supporting our World IBD Day campaign. With that said, let's get into it. So, Kay, to start, can you share a little bit about your journey with Crohn's disease to say when were you first diagnosed and how did you know that something was wrong? Okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. It's a kind of real honor to be, to be part of this for World IBD Day. So I've had Crohn's disease from quite an early age, from the age of 13. Um, so I started to get symptoms from the age of 10. And so when you're 10, you don't really know what is happening. You, you know that something is different with your body. But it was very much my parents who took the lead and took, took me to a gastroenterologist um, where at that time I underwent a few investigations um, and then was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And again, didn't really know what it meant. Um, and it was more symptoms of diarrhea, um, abdominal pain, urgency to go to the toilet. At that time, I also had kind of like vulval symptoms. So I had a lot of swelling around the front. Um, and again, as a, as a young girl approaching teenage years, I didn't know what it was or, or the reason for it. And so that was kind of my early experiences really of, of being diagnosed with Crohn's disease. And it was quite a few years after that, that I kind of got lost in the system for various reasons of moving home and things like that. And so I didn't actually get a review appointment. I was never started on medication. And so it wasn't really until a couple of years later when I was around 13, 14, that I had my official diagnosis and was started on medication. Oh, wow. Thank you for sharing that. And so can you tell us some more about why you decided then to establish IBD Passport as then a resource for other Crohn's as well as colitis patients? Part of it was my passion for just, just my job as an IBD nurse practitioner. Um, I had patients who would come to me asking advice about travel, um, particularly mm -hmm. patients on biologics who may be leading up to being on biologics were so sick that they couldn't travel and they didn't even think about traveling. But then when they're on biologics, suddenly they felt so much better and they wanted to do all the things that they'd wanted to do before. 
they wanted to travel and have gap years abroad and experience all those fun things. But then they felt that they couldn't because they felt that the fact that they were on this medication stopped them. And so, you know, quite often in my job as a nurse practitioner, I had patients asking me these questions. And part of it was also my own experience. So um, graduating from university when I did my nursing studies, I worked for six months as a nurse and then went traveling for 12 months. Um, and it was my experiences of traveling with Crohn's disease when it wasn't entirely under control and just the hurdles of doing that, that I think probably gave me a passion for realizing that this is something that's needed. Yes, it absolutely is needed and the people that use it really appreciate it. And so, you know, I was actually thinking earlier about that famous quote, it's not the destination, it's the journey, that kind yeah. of like, <laughs> I feel like that sort of rings especially true <laughs> for people with IBD, right? Because it's that yeah. journey sometimes, like the long plane flights, train or bus or car rides that can sometimes be the most stressful when traveling. So I'd love to hear a little bit about maybe advice you can give to IBD patients who struggle with that, that journey. <laughs> I suppose really a lot of it for, for any travel, uh, whether it's, you know, whatever form of transport, the main thing is just to prepare. And again, I've seen this a lot in, in my nursing career where a patient will come to me and say that they are traveling and they're going to a destination and they're wanting advice, but they leave in three weeks. And planning is so essential because if you're going on short haul and if it's a short trip for a few mm -hmm. days, it doesn't really matter, you know, depending on what destination you're going to. But if you're going to on a long haul trip, where you might need vaccinations, or if maybe you've got a stoma or you're on TPN um, and you need to prepare a little bit more, then, it, then it's really important. And it very much depends on the reason for your travel, the duration of your trip, but especially when you're looking at long haul flights, so if you're saying the destination such as flying, as an example, that can have an impact on, you know, studies have shown that long haul flight and especially flights at altitude, because you're above 10,000 feet, can possibly induce flares. Um, there's only a few studies, so the studies aren't conclusive at all, but there are some studies. There's the well-known risk of DVT. Um, so especially if patients are traveling when maybe the symptoms aren't under control, that risk is increased. And so all, all those things really need to be taken into consideration. But the main one is about planning ahead. If you're going to be traveling for a long duration of tra time or doing multiple trips, you've really got to get a bit more organized, look at vaccinations, look at what IBD care is available, um, research the destinations, make sure you take enough medication with you. Wow, thank you. That's so interesting about that altitude study, even if it's not conclusive. That's, I never heard yeah. that, that's really interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been one or two studies. So again, there needs to be more research, um, but the research did find that there was a slight increased risk for people that were on long haul flights. Well, well then, kind of segueing, talking about flares then, um, would you say that an IBD patient in other respects increases their risk of flaring when traveling? I wouldn't say as a general rule, all travel increases risk of a flare. I think there are certain factors that may induce more symptoms. So for example, change of diet, change of food and water, different environment, might not necessarily be a flare, but it can definitely change the gut flora. So it can change the microbiomes in the gut and it can make it so maybe your stool may be a little bit looser or you may get a little bit of diarrhea that might need to be treated. Um, sometimes with people, the, the stress of travel um, and the worry of that can sometimes then bring on symptoms. And also there might be some cases where because people are on holiday, they may or may not take their medication as regimented as they do when they're at home and that can also have an impact um, and especially if, if people have got stomas 
then the and the kind of climate can have an impact it can cause dehydration it can cause the stoma to function differently and that also might be something that people need to take into consideration got it I would actually love to touch on the first thing that you mentioned, which was uh, diet. Um, obviously, when you're traveling, you really divert from your whole, you know, daily routine. And I think definitely the way that we eat is the biggest thing that gets impacted. Um, I would love if you could maybe elaborate on that, especially with regards to maybe how IBD patients can try to minimize the impact that diet changes might have while traveling. Yeah, I mean, diet can have an impact. And obviously, when you go on holiday, you want to experience the local culture, you want to, you know, eat and drink, and you do tend to eat and drink more than what you would do when you're at home. I suppose it depends again on the destination. If you're going somewhere within America and, you know, your diet is mainly going to be potentially the same, but with slight variances, then it's just a case of thinking, well, okay, if I do have symptoms, what is it that I've eaten? Is it something that I've had differently, maybe a different cuisine that you've had because you're visiting a different area um, and that, that kind of thing? Obviously, the, the sensible things, such as if you go into things like an all-inclusive resort and it's a buffet, just being aware of the kinds of foods that you're eating, foods like maybe meats and fish and, and eggs that, you know, are they fresh? How long have they been there for? Ice, which many people know is a big one. Ice is occasionally, depending on your destination, could just be made by local water rather than, and that can have an impact and can cause stomach disturbances. But what I would generally say is just be mindful and just be aware. And that is where I guess when, as part of the preparation for travel, I always advise kind of users of the IBD Passport website to take like a travel kit with them like an emergency travel kit so which will include things that you can either buy over the counter or that are prescribed by the gastroenterologist or nurse practitioner so things such as emodium or um, kind of uh, loperamide and um, diorolite in case they do get kind of imbalances in fluid things that can help with kind of gut spasms. Um, I mean, in the UK, there's a pr product called Buscapan. So I'm sure you have something similar. So it just kind of helps with gut spasms and helps to kind of slow the gut down. Always useful as well to maybe get a prescription of antibiotics for traveler's diarrhea mm -hmm. from your IBD team with instructions of how to take them and when to seek help and how to differentiate between a flare Things like that are kind of good and it's a bit diverse from the question of diet, but it, it kind of segues onto it, really. Yeah, in fact, it's a perfect segue because I wanted to talk a little bit about medication after that. So whether it's over the counters, like you said, or your prescribed prescription, or even for some with a TPN, um, what advice would you have for traveling with it, especially for those who maybe are worried about going through airport security with you know bottles of pills and whatnot? Yeah, the most important thing is to always carry either a copy of your prescription if you get one kind of administered or a letter from your gastroenterologist or IBD nurse practitioner which outlines your diagnosis the medication you're taking if it's medication that's temperature sensitive um, such as some of the biologics um, the fact that it needs to be kept in a cool wallet uh, the fact that maybe it has needles that go with it um, and the reason for that. And quite often, as long as it's on headed paper, then the airport security are fine by it, with it. It's always good if you're unsure to call ahead to the airline mm -hmm. and just to say, look, you know, this is the situation. Is there anything specific that you need me to do? Obviously, TSA as well, that, you know, they could be, you know, get, getting kind of pre-check helps. Mm -hmm. Um, really useful to do that um, and again just it just make t make sure you take enough medication with you and also enough in case you get any delays because the worst thing is having delays or into in your trip and a lot of this happened during covid where people were stranded in certain areas and they didn't have medication and they couldn't get thing get the medication to them and that was a that was a big thing that's something that IBD Passport you know did help with with the logistics of connecting patients um with regards to TPN 
a lot of the time there's a, a lot of things that are needed to be taken when patients are on TPN. So quite often the nutrition nurse and TPN nurse are the best people to advise regarding that because there's special letters you can get. There's um, special allowances from the airline to take extra luggage for medication and things like stoma supplies and medication supplies. So sometimes you can get um, extra baggage for free when you're traveling because you've got a medical condition. Yes, it's a big help when you're trying to make that a weight limit <laughs> with your carry-on, for sure. Yeah. And, um, definitely yeah. another stressor, especially for, oh, I don't want to cut you off. Did you have anything to oh, add? Oh, yes. No, sorry. All I was going to say as well is it's also important to take medication and supply in your hand luggage and in your pack luggage, because if any luggage gets lost, at least you've got some medication with you. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that was included. Um, but yep, as I was going to say, though, definitely a big stressor um, and the same kind of regard for those with the ostomy uh, would be the same thing going through airport security, having that. Yes. So if there's any way for those patients in particular to prepare for a flight. There is, and it's a really good question, actually. And it's, some, it's something that both in my role as kind of chair in the charity, with all the inquiries that we get through our emails and also as an IBD nurse practitioner, I've experienced a lot. Um, it, can, it can be very embarrassing for people going through security because the, they have to do their checks, they have to do the due diligence and with the scanners. So the number one thing I would say is to always empty your stoma before you go through airport security. Because quite often when you go in through the scanners, it will pick up any kind of anomalies of what the scanner sees that it feels shouldn't be there. And then that will lead to you being taken to one side and it can be an embarrassing situation. So I would say number one, that definitely helps. Also leading up to your trip, try and avoid foods that you know are going to aggravate your stoma, cause wind, cause issues. You will obviously get some issues in the air anyway, which from the stoma bag and the stoma supply company can help with that because you can get filters and little charcoal filters for that. But if you've had food that is known to be gas producing, then you will have problems and it will, and it will cause you more gas on the ground, but especially more gas when you're in the plane, for example. Um, I would say there's um, certain foods as well that can kind of help to firm up the kind of output from the stoma. Things like jelly babies are good that um, people can have and it just helps to firm up the stoma output. And so maybe helps reduce, reduce that and the need for, for people to kind of have a bag change during a flight or during a long car or a train ride. Um, what else would I say? Another important thing is again, talk to your stoma nurse, talk to your stoma supply company. It's something that a lot of the stoma companies have got a lot of information on. You know, I've got an IBD passport. There are things such as a stoma passport mm -hmm. where there are letters that the stoma, stoma companies can provide that explain and give you really good tips on how to manage your stoma for any sort of travel, whether it's a long car, train or a flight. And there is a specific section on IBD passport called um, travel after surgery. And it's got lots of information and lots of links um, to different stoma companies and also tips on things that you can do with your diet and how to manage the stoma as well. That's great. Travel after surgery. That's good for people to know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'd say that we've covered the journey pretty well so far. So now we can talk a bit maybe about arriving to the destination. Uh, when we think about international travel especially, there can often be that extra barrier to navigate um, in terms of language. So um, do you have any advice for IBD patients um, that might help them prepare to navigate a language barrier, uh, things that might complicate their journey in that regard? So there are really useful um, kind of cards available in multiple languages. Um, there is a company called, from memory, I think it's called dietcard.org. And so if people have got particular dietary requirements or intolerances, 
you can actually request a card in the language of the country that you're visiting and it will come and you can then just show it and it just allows you to get more freedom in restaurants also um there are things like you know the can't wait cards or the bathroom cards and these are often available in different languages as well not every language but they'll be available in the most common languages other tips are there are a couple of good obviously most people will be aware of google translate mm -hmm. which is a really useful app there is another one called deep l so it's deep and then the l um, that, they are both particularly good and they've got a lot of different language variations that you can do. So just some key phrases in case you are sick and you need to see a doctor. So just think of what you would do if you went to your emergency department and the kind of things that you would say to a doctor or a nurse if you were sick or you had stomach pain or you needed to go to the toilet and maybe jot down a few of those phrases and have them ready to do a screenshot from Google Translate so that you can just show it to people. And that is another thing that can help because it'll just take the pressure off and you know that if you do get sick and you do need a help, you know, where's the nearest hospital or I've got stomach pain or, you know, just your, your basic things that you think you might need. And it'll just take the stresses out of you worrying if you are caught in a situation where you're unwell. Yes, yeah, it's definitely harder to kind of rack your brain for uh, those other phrases when you're in, you know, it in is. serious pain, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, gotcha. And so let's see what else. Um, so let's think about um, IBD patients who might be traveling for a more extended period then, taking a gap year like you mentioned earlier, studying abroad. Um, what are things that um, maybe are particular to them to consider? I think this goes back to my first point of making sure that they plan for travel. You know, what is your itinerary? I know quite often it's not easy because you don't want to be stuck with an itinerary, but it depends on the reason for the travel. Is it just going to be a backpacking gap year, traveling around either America or further afield? Is it going to be stops at multiple destinations? How long are you going to plan to be in those destinations? what medication are you taking and all of that you know what is the reason for travel are you traveling just for leisure or are you going to be working or studying and we get a lot of, of questions from people who are planning to travel you know quite a few each week where people want to know I'm, I'm traveling to this destination and what advice can you give and the first thing I always say is exactly what I've just done so why are you traveling what are your destinations? How long are you going to be there? What medication are you on? And will you be undertaking any sort of activity where you may have be covered by a visa, for example? So if you're going to be working or if you're going to be studying, chances are you'll be covered by a visa for that country, which will then mean that you will get some sort of health coverage. It may not be the equivalent of somebody who's a resident in that country, but it may be discounted rate, or it might be enough that you'll then also maybe get some travel insurance. In which case, you, you need to find out what that is, contact the embassies and find out exactly what you'll be covered for and what you won't be covered for. If you're taking biologics, would that be covered or would you need to get private insurance or pay privately to get the medication in that country? Um, Things like your biologics, if, if patients are taking those, so, you know, your kind of NTBO and uh, Remicade, that sort of thing, the medication that you're taking, is it actually available in that country? Because quite a lot of time, certain brands of medication might not be in every single country. Um, so that's a consideration. And that is something that you can find out as in via IBD passport you can actually find it out via the pharmaceutical companies sometimes about whether they have that medication in that particular country and quite a lot of the time as well like gastroenterologists and IBD nurse practitioners even though we're in different countries we have got networks among each other and so if patients ask their IBD team 
they might know of a doctor that they've chatted to at a conference somewhere that they can then talk to. And it's almost a bit like the IBD Passport network that we've got, where it connects IBD clinics and, and IBD patients together. But yeah, that's kind of, I suppose going back to that, so for people who are traveling, who maybe just are traveling for leisure, that I would say is the trickiest group for traveling if they're on medication that is requires funding. So medication, that, that, that can sometimes be difficult to negotiate. If someone's traveling for leisure, doing a gap year abroad, it's not impossible, but it would need a lot more planning of, of agreeing where they're gonna be at certain times. Some countries will allow medication to be transferred, so basically the IBD team in their country will give them vials of medication or give them their medication, which can then be infused in another centre in another country. But not every country does that. So again, and sometimes they would have to pay private costs for that infusion. So there's a lot of things to navigate. It's not impossible and it is easy to do. And that's exactly what kind of the IBD Passport charity does, really. We help the logistics of people who are travelling um, and help to connect them to IBD centres. Oh, that's so great. There's so many logistics to figure out when traveling. Right. Anybody, it, can so. it can be done. And what I want people to know is that it might sound like it's a difficult thing, but, but it isn't. You just need to speak to your IBD team, contact people like Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America, who can then maybe kind of put you in touch with people like myself. And there is ways of, of kind of working things out and, and kind of planning things. All right, great. So another consideration that I want to touch on, any IBD patient is well aware that IBD isn't just a disease that affects the gut, it also affects joints and other parts of the body. Um, but thinking about joint pain in particular, uh, that can really impact a person traveling, especially someone that's really on the go, you know. So um, what advice would you give for IBD patients experiencing joint pain who are expecting to travel soon? I think the, the advice is very much similar to what it would be with, with kind of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. The difference is that if patients are experiencing joint pain, it limits mobility. So in an ideal world, it is better to try and travel when the joint pain is under control um, to make sure that you are under the care of a rheumatologist who can get you on the adequate medication. If that isn't possible, then when you're traveling, you can have things like a sunflower lanyard, mm. which is really good for helping. It just, it doesn't say that, it just says that you've got a hidden disability or an invisible illness that requires some more help when you're either at a public train station. And it is generally an internationally recognized symbol that you've got a lanyard which suggests that you need extra help. Um, if you feel comfortable, you can actually divulge what it is and what kind of help that you need. But it will be things like when you're in a busy train station or an airport, you might be able to get help through security or you might be able to get help getting from one terminal to another rather than you know maybe help boarding the plane a little bit sooner than anybody else or leaving because of the mobility issues if it is a, if your mobility is that much of a problem that you do need some extra support so there's little things like that that you can do but also speak to your kind of family doctor even your ibd team or rheumatologist regarding medications to try and help with the joint pain and to try and get it under control quite often joint pain not always, but is associated with active disease. And so if you can try and get the active disease under control, then the joint pain will also, I mean, it's not always the case, but quite often. Gotcha. And so we've reached our last question already. And I'm gonna say it's one of the most important ones even, uh, because I think it kind of touches every tactic you've given for you know trying to manage travel. It's, um, really how can an IBD patient advocate for themselves to ensure their needs are met while they're traveling? It's really important that um, 
patients advocate for themselves in every aspect of IBD, not just in travel. And I think a lot of it is just empowering themselves with knowledge, just being aware of what their options are, how to manage their symptoms, you know, to be in control of their Crohn's and colitis rather than Crohn's and colitis controlling them. And a lot of it is just, is just knowledge being empowered with having that awareness of what to do, when to do it, what your symptoms are, how to manage it. And again, in relation to travel, just don't leave in things, don't leave things to the last minute. Research, take it, take control of it yourself and think, right, I'm traveling, I'm gonna do this, I'm not gonna let this stop me. And there's no reason why you should. Um, but actually just just plan a little bit and just make sure that you're empowered with all that information so that when you do travel, if you encounter problems, you, you're, you're OK. You've kind of thought of it and, and you've got it all planned and you know who to contact. You know, make, no matter where you are in the world, you can still contact your IBD nurse practitioner or usually your gastroenterology team and get advice. Um, but yeah, that's the main thing I would say. Yeah, and you've mentioned so many other great ways just throughout our conversation, talking about calling ahead for yeah. the, the TSA or asking yeah. security guards in the yeah. train station. It might seem embarrassing in the moment, right? But it's it's so, like it made such an impact, you know, on your overall yeah, experience, it, doesn't it? It does. Things like, you know, TSA pre-check, signing up for global entry, things that just make your life a little bit easier. So you, you're a bit easier through customs, you're not stuck in long queues, you know, it kind of all just helps. And as I say, just kind of planning ahead and just thinking, okay, what, what do I need? I need my medication. Maybe I could look up if there's any IBD centers in the country that I'm visiting, you know, especially for longer trips, it's an essential really. For shorter trips, you know, there's, up usually always going to be emergency medical centres. But if, if somebody has got their last clinic letter from their recent office visit with them, that's got all their medications, maybe a recent investigations and what's happening with their health, it just makes life a lot easier. Yes. All right, well, we're reaching the end of our chat for tonight. Um, but I want to open a little, you know, a moment for you. If you have any closing remarks, anything to highlight or, you know, just any last thing to say I mean I think the main thing is I just really want to encourage everyone to try to just get out there and travel international travel is not for everybody but there's loads of places to go locally and you know it's just do whatever you feel is comfortable for you whatever is in your comfort zone and also whatever whatever you feel especially when, when you've got symptoms and you've got a flare and if if you are on TPN and you you know, it, it is a bind sometimes to travel and you may not feel that you're able to, but if you do plan ahead, then you then you can. And it is, it's just really to encourage people to say that, you know, I suppose with your campaign, it isn't game over, but really, yeah. you, you know, you, you should just embrace life and just try and do whatever it is that you feel is, is in your ability to do really in your comfort zone. Yes. All right, well, thank you, Kay, so much for taking your time today, for sharing your own IBD journey with us and sharing your expertise for those trying to travel. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. All right, and for the audience, if you enjoyed today's session, we hope you will share the recording of this chat with other members of the IBD community. It'll be available on our Facebook page as well as our YouTube channel. And as a reminder, our IBD Help Center is available to answer any questions you may have after today's chat, anything we didn't get a chance to cover or anything you want to hear more in depth. And you can contact the IBD Help Center once again by emailing info at Crohn's, excuse me, at info at Crohn's and Colitis Foundation.org or by calling the phone number 1-888-MY-GUT-PAIN. And thank you so much to everyone that joined us and take care.